yeah no that's that's fun i do like to go and visit little places when i can i've been kind of trying to visit a bunch of not even not just burial sites but finds and oh there's so many cross stone you know like cross shafts and the hogback stones and yeah so i went to see the hogbacks and there's a bunch of just just in general just i think there's a ton of cross shafts and some some like entire crosses that are still there's like a bunch in and around yorkshire um and i went up to see the the loki stone i can't i actually can't say familiar with that the Loki, it's it's the Loki or Bound Devil Stone. It's up on the border of Cumbria, and I think it could be Loki, but they don't know if it really is. But it's from I think the ninth century. It's it's early, um, but they're not kind of sure what it is. But it does look like oh, a oh yeah, like a devil bound. Which yeah, could be, yeah. I just googled it. But I had a I had a girl on here who specializes in all Loki saga material, and she was saying that there's very little to to even suggest people knew of Loki during the Viking Age. She was like, "There's hardly anything at all. Well, oh, nothing. There's there's like these two stones. I think there's that one and one in uh oh, it's gone out of the head top of my head. The the island." In Sweden, where everything Scotland. is found. Scotland, yeah. So I think there's one there that might have Loki on. But other than that, there's no like place names. There's pretty much nothing. So she was like, yeah, maybe he didn't exist. <laughs> Which I love stuff like that. Yeah, no, I mean, like, um, yeah, I've, like, I like I was a bit, when, when Bob asked me if I wanted to be on the Nordic Mythology podcast, I was a bit like, I mean, I don't do any kind of Nor- Nordic mythology stuff, mostly because it's like, so outside the bounds of what I do as an archaeologist and historian, mm-hmm. you know, and because it is, it's just, there's not a lot of like contemporary ninth, 10th century evidence for any sort of, you know, for the mythology. Not, not mm-hmm. a lot. There's some, but not, not a lot. So I was it, but, um, but he did say you guys had like um, expanded out a little bit. So yeah, we do bits. the The name happened right at the start. But saying that, even when we when we first started, I don't think we did. I think the first episode we ever did was on shield maidens, and then we did symbols. So we've kind of it's never really been. I don't even know where the name come, <laughs> came from. We just needed a name. Yeah. I think I think Mateus had a a channel called the Nordic Mythology Channel or something, and we were just like. Let's just add podcast to the end. Perfect. <laughs> It'll be Perfect. Fun. It'll work. So, yeah, that's where it came. And we we haven't stuck to to mythology, and that's the fun part. That it's kind of everything all together, and you get to speak to people like you. Who, I guess are more fact based, and what we what we have, and not as. And then, whereas last week I spoke to. Uh, a gentleman who does a lot of cooking and tries to recreate things from, um, recreate like recipes from old material, not necessarily from the Vikings. He says there's not much, but maybe after all, look at like what ingredients they would have had. So he's very much kind of experimental archaeology. And I yeah. enjoy, I enjoy that just as much as anything else. It's kind of this whole mix of everything together. And I think that's how you get closer to the truth than just one. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I was, um, I actually spent, uh, I was doing a dig in Lancaster and we went out to Hisham, um, and Morecambe Bay and we met someone when we were looking at a hogback stone, um, at, a, at I think at the Hisham church. Uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure that there's one there. But we were talking to someone and he was saying that they, like his grandmother made nettle beer that okay. like that he was that like grandmother was convinced was passed down from the viking age oh, and wow. like you know we were a bit like oh, okay but like at the same time too like the idea that that tradition has remained and the idea that like there is that cultural awareness it, it was yeah it was cozy it was definitely very nice and i guess there's no it's so easy to roll your eyes at 
So, because anybody who hangs out on Facebook <laughs> any length of time amongst anything to do with the Vikings, you tend to get people who are like, oh, I'm descended from Ragnar or I'm descended from Odin. Um, and they're like adamant that they can prove that, or even even people like I'm descended from Harold Fine, I can prove it to that. It's like, no, you fucking can't. Like, well, stop it. Actually, the way that genetics works, anyone with European an- ancestry genetically has been descended from Charlemagne. That's okay. a fact. Oh, that's really? A, yeah, that's just the way that genetics works. Like, by the time that you go up to your great great grandparents, you have thirty two great great grandparents. Okay. And so, as you as you splinter out, everyone with European ancestry descended from Charlemagne. I feel like that's a cop out. I'm not gonna lie. I feel like that. I feel but like it's that's, true. It's I, true. I believe that it's true, but I feel like that's not the point they're trying to make. They're trying to make how they can pinpoint the line all the way back. And, oh no! Absolutely, absolutely. Like, I just, I'm just saying that you can then turn around and be like, "Yeah, so am I." Oh, okay. I, I don't really care. But it was more to the point that you get these stories of yes. of like these things passed down, and and you hear that about then the nettle um, beer, and it's like, oh yeah, whatever. But maybe. You know, things have survived through oral traditions and for much longer. So there's no yeah. reason why it's not. Exactly. Yeah. But like I skept- said, it's cozy. It's cozy. Skeptic in me always is like, yeah, whatever. I think nettle beer is a little bit less ideological than descended from Ragnar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Ragnar's always won, and and I would love to know how many people de- descended from Ragnar had the TV show not focused around Ragnar. Don't get me started on the TV show. Because <laughs> I guarantee it would be not as many. Yeah. Nowhere near. Yeah. Yep. Uh, oh, I probably should do an intro because I'm gonna keep this this start in. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. I'm just good. It's Tanaya. 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 Tanaya Jorgensen. There we go. I'm, 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 this is all staying in, so people are going to hear me checking your name as well. So it is what yeah, it's, it is. It's, it's a mouthful, yes. Tanaya Jorgensen. <laughs> all right. Welcome to the Northern Mythology Podcast. Uh, I, I guess the intro is a little bit late, but I'm sat down with Tanaya Jorgensen, which you heard because I just had to check how to pronounce it. Uh, and we're going to talk about mapping the Viking Age. You've made this beautiful you said 3000 point map roughly trying to add some chronological order to the viking age am i right in that yeah i mean i guess like what we we talked a little bit beforehand like i'm not a gatekeeper to the idea of knowledge especially because the viking age and viking history is so fraught right now in the context of the adoption of the far right um and so I'm just trying to take a little bit of the mystery and maybe a little bit of, as I said before, the ideology out of the Viking Age and just presenting a really useful tool for both the general public and teachers and students um, mm. to explore the Viking Age using both historical sources, what we have from that period, and also um uh, archaeological material, including graves and um, female jewelry, uh, specifically in Britain only, and um, coin hoards. So yeah, I just I I'm an archaeologist by trade. Um, I uh, did my PhD in history and archaeology as a, well. I I did my PhD in history, but incorporated archaeology into my research and. Um, so yeah, I have taken a fact base, but I'm also a highly visual learner. I tried to create something fun for everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you kindly earlier said, and I quote, uh, "I don't give a fuck. I'll <laughs> share the the link," um, which which I think is brilliant that you're happy to kind of put it out there and let people look at it and learn from it. And then, like you say, there's no gatekeeping around your work. You're happy to to let people enjoy it and like yeah like i said learn and use it and hopefully like you say take some of that ideology out of it and we can just disprove a few a few of those assholes on that side it would be good yes that would be super nice if we could do that so we will put the link 
in the show notes for anybody that's listening. You can just pop down. And when I say show notes, I, I don't know if everyone always knows what that is. It's like the little bit of text beneath the podcast, wherever you download it, there's like a little description in there. We'll hit the hit the link and you can check it out because there are a bunch of places on there. I'm going to, certainly going to have a closer look at it and see what I can go and visit. Yes. Yeah, so it's um, basically... It focuses on Ireland, Britain, and um, France and Germany, um, a little bit of Spain as well. So it doesn't focus on Scandinavia itself, and mostly that has to do with the fact that there are no contemporary sources for the Vikings, the Viking Age, and Scandinavia itself. So all that we have from that period, and by con- uh, contemporary, I do mean that like um, written at the time that those things were happening. And so, um, so yeah, so the Vikings themselves, we have, yeah, rune stones, but even then the rune stones tend to be a little bit later, like 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th century. Mm-hmm. And, um, they don't really communicate action or chronological happening in the way that, um, continental, uh, British, Irish, uh, chronicles were, were taking mm-hmm. notes. So. Yeah, I assume we're talking about Vikings in the literal sense of people who go in yes. raiding. So I guess yes. that would be why you maybe you wouldn't see so much within Scandinavia itself. Well, there's just nothing being written there. Nothing's being written until the arrival of of Christianity. But uh, that got me thinking. Okay, maybe you know the answer to this or not. This is how the the show works, by the way. That okay. things just pop up into my head, and then I I just ask them. Go nuts. Um, did, did the did people in Scandinavia in the Viking Age go a Viking within Scandinavia? Do we have yes? So so that was it. Just got me thinking because I always thought like externally, and then a little light bulb moment happened. I was like, oh, yeah, but why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they go and? Well, yeah, yeah, you know they absolutely from did. Those over there, they absolutely did. Um, I think like uh, we you can you can argue that the Scandinavians. Um, the Norwegians, Swedes, you know, there is, there was a shift already between the Finns in the far North who are the the Sápmi today, the Sami. Um, They were very distinct culturally from European Scandinavian, I suppose, which were kind of Othera's voyage, which was recorded um, in the court of Alfred the Great. He uh, had a Norwegian um, merchant come to his court who told his story. It was written down in his court in uh, Old English, and it records how he went raiding north um, north of his home in Trondelag at Trondheim um, and raided against the Finns. So, okay. And I think there is also in the Frankish annals, the Danish king sends an envoy to the court of of the Franks saying, okay, there were some Danish raids, there were some pirate raids going on in your coast, but they were not my military. And I've captured these Danish pirates and I have killed them. Mm-hmm. And then he asked for a reward mm-hmm. from the Franks. So I mean that feels like I don't know if business model is the right <laughs> the right way to put it. But I, waiting for somebody to go to Britain and do mm-hmm. their raiding, get all the booty and put it on the ship and bring it back. It feels like it's quite a good idea just to, instead of going all the way to Britain, just go there and steal it from them instead. Just be like, because I imagine they, if if they suffered loss, they would, they, the army wouldn't be as strong. So it would, even if they won, it would maybe still be depleted. Maybe you could just go and be like... I'm going to come over there. Depends on what you're looking for. I think Scandinavia at that time was not very rich in silver and gold. So, I mean, even like Gotland covered in silver Durham hordes, right? Covered in silver Durham hordes. There's not a lot of silver Durham hordes into Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for mineral wealth, if you're looking for metals, you've got to leave Scandinavia to do that. No, but I mean, if you were, if you knew... It's let's say you were the a chieftain in Denmark, and then mm-hmm. you, knew, or even within Norway itself, like you were just a chieftain in in Norway, and you knew like hundred miles north, 
there was another chieftain who was sending a raiding party to England. I feel like just wait for them to come back with all the gold and silver and then just nip up there. And certainly if it was before there was like a united king mm-hmm. that, who could maybe then punish you, uh, maybe if it was like when it was like every man for themselves, you could just kind of nip up and be like, hey, I want that now. I think that likely happened. We just don't have the records for it. Mm. And there is a theory that has been presented, and I actually build on it in my thesis, that um, the reason that the rating started is because there was centralization of power, it, like especially along the western coast of Norway, where you had all these tribes and um, these these smaller kings, these smaller chieftains were being pushed out by a centralizing power that was growing to claim kingship. And that's why the raid started to begin with, because they were losing their, you know, if we want to use a Game of Thrones term, they were had, they were forced to bend the knee. So they were losing their kind of lands or material wealth and sought it out in a different, in a different country, different place. Okay. So I see, I thought you were going to say that it's like a united, like, I don't know if United Kingdom is the right word, but like a united force would then allow the resources to be able to go further afield, whereas maybe individually they wouldn't have had the, the, the manpower maybe to, because I imagine it's, I, I've always wondered this, I guess, and we're going, I guess we're going quite far off topic, but I've always wondered how, you know, if you're taking a ship of, a ship of mm. 30 men, mm. I just feel like that's very brave to land on land you don't know and be like and just go and steal things and think that you're gonna get away okay i feel like i mean i wouldn't do it yeah so i feel like i would want there's more power in numbers i guess i mean i think it's that cost versus reward analysis going on Mm -hmm. it it had to be had to be worth it i mean it has to be terrifying to just be I don't know this land and we've, because it's not like a full army. You can't take, obviously in some extreme cases, like the but they started, they started by, they started by raiding the monasteries, mm-hmm. right? Like, like that's, that was their target. Like they went to Iona, they went to Lindisfarne, they went to Jero, they went to um, the island of Inish Bothan on the west coast of Ireland. Like they, they raided monasteries. Like no one, no one there had weapons. They were like, and, and, and not only were they taking silk, and I was just on an archaeological excavation here in Norway um, at a place called Sem, and it's very close to where they found the Hohen Hoard. So if anyone's interested in metal, check out the Hohen Hoard in Norway. It's fantastic. It's gorgeous. So we were two kilometers away from there. And a metal detectorist had found a part of an Irish reliquary box, which was so cool. Mm-hmm. And um, so we know that some Irish Viking Age shit had come over from and landed over there as well as the Hohen Horde. And um, so, yeah, the, the big thing is that all these uh, they're, they're raiding, they're raiding monasteries, not only for silver, for gold, for books, for things that are valuable, but they're also taking slaves. Mm-hmm. Probably not, not, not a lot to begin with, but you know, one or two, taking them home, putting them on the farm, making them do work. Yeah. Like the cost versus reward, I think the reward was very high. Yeah, I always find it quite funny how they, they seem to be the at the minute anyway. There seems to be this very like I think like a misconception of how like people in the Viking Age were almost better than now like you always hear this thing of like oh it was very equal between men and women that's always one that you hear all that like you you may maybe not within like your the scholarly world but you out like i'm obviously like outside of that and you hear this all the time about how things were like perfectly equal and it's almost also almost utopian um but people forget that they they took they took slaves and I'm not in any defense of slavery, but you can clearly understand why. Well, you can understand why they would do that because it's like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna come to this place where there's these people. We can take them back and make them do the manual labor that I really don't want to do because it stinks, and I can spend my time doing things that 
I want to do. I'm not, I'm not advocating that it's the right thing to do, but I'm saying in a time a thousand years ago, I can, you can see why it was an option when your only goal is to make your life easier and to make wealth. And you're not, I mean, they're either taking them off slaves or they're killing them. They're the two options. But they but, weren't always killing them. I mean, they clearly left witnesses. But what okay, I would yeah, say, I, I w- what I would say is that in this early medieval period, I mean, and you know, this is coming on the backs of the Roman period, and Roman was a slave empire. It was a slave empire. You know, um, human life was cheap, mm-hmm. and and it did not contain even within Christian nations at the time. It did not contain that same kind of Christian morality of souls and everyone, you know, is going to heaven. Like it was very much like, uh, life was cheap and you needed farm laborers. You needed, you needed house workers. You, you needed hands Mm. and the idea of equality, like it's, it's very nice now. And I'm very happy to be living in the 21st century, but you know, we can't, truly the past is a different country the past is a foreign country like we cannot think about the viking age using our modern Mm -hmm. brains it was a completely different culture a completely different time people died people lived in vastly different ways like death for us now is so sterilized you know like when was like when was the last time you saw somebody die it's a very infrequent occurrence god bless like i mean not god bless but Anyway, it's a very infrequent occurrence within Western society, mm-hmm. thankfully. And, um, but it wasn't then, you know, they, everyone slept in the same room. So the act of sex was very much, it, it, it was public. It was, you yeah. know, childbirth was public. Death was public. So it, it's a different world. Yeah. It was just different. You can't look at it through. The yeah. lens of today, I guess. Exactly. Which too many people do. Yes. I do find it, yeah, I do find it very infuriating. Um, okay, so you mentioned two two monasteries earlier, Iona and Lindisfarne. And mm. that and we mentioned I mentioned before the podcast how it would be fun to look at the starting point of the Viking Age. Mm. Because obviously you've you've taken the time to to map this out and use what you can to chronologically put some order to it. Um, yeah. Now, obviously, to most people, Lindisfarne is the start of the Viking Age. It's the one that pops up if you type into Google. When did the Viking Age start? It's 793? 793, am I right? Yeah, 793. Oh, fuck it. I've learned something during this podcast. I, just, I don't know where I pulled that one from. Um, but yeah, so most people will say that's the start of the Viking Age, but obviously, like with it's Iona, not. There, we, there we go. There's, there's my little segue. Yeah, no. Um, I so on my map, I have the timeline of the Viking Age. Uh, uh, Viking activity begins in 777, and so the idea of Viking, I think, um, we kind of have to use that term just as like kind of a catch-all. Because my argument is that the Viking Age does not start with the raid on Lindisfarne. The Viking Age starts with politics. It starts with diplomacy. It starts with the encroachment of the Frankish kingdom up into the Danish lands. And you were talking about unification. I use the term centralization. Um, Like powers are centralizing around a king. Mm -hmm. So I truly believe that at the beginning of the Viking Age in the late 700s denmark was a centralized kingdom i call it the danish kingdom the danish state i don't call it denmark because it doesn't reflect the later medieval denmark but at this time i do think that there was a royal family ruling over a centralized danish state um probably as a reaction the strengthening as a reaction to the franks Um, gaining strength themselves, Charlemagne pushing northwards against the Saxons. The Saxons stood between the Danes Mm -hmm. and the Franks. And when Charlemagne conquered the Franks, you've got to, you've got to imagine the Danes were like, fuck. Yeah. So do you Um, you think that centralization is like a coming together as a, again, like we said earlier, like a united people against a common enemy? 
I don't, I, I can't call it united. I can't call it united. Like I said, it's centralized that okay. there was, there was a king who ruled over a populated territory who maybe did not get a bunch of chieftains to unite against the Franks, but certainly had created enough stability within their rule that they were able to send in, in 782, they were able to send um, Norse emissaries of King Sigrid. And this is in the Royal Frankish Channel, 782. Uh, King Sigrid sent emissaries down to Charlemagne's court and um, asked for peace. Yeah. And that's 782. So 777, uh, Wittekind Saxon escapes from an attack of the Franks over the Danish border and harbors with the Danish court. 782, King Sigrid, Sin, King, Sig, King Sigrid of the Danes is sent emissaries down asking for peace. Charlemagne goes cool bro and that to me is the beginning of the Viking Age because what you have is the centralizing of Danish power which probably includes uh, southern the Oslo Fjord southern Sweden um, a loose confederation I wouldn't call it a unionization but a loose confederation of power over these tribes power over these earldoms um, and then you have these ripplings of centralizing of power that head up along the western coast of Norway as well, where you see centralizing kings coming along there as well. What do you think the reason is for them centralizing? Is it, I guess, is it because they're looking south and are fearful, so they band together or in some way band together? Or is it that a single person is looking south and saying, I want to be like that, so I'm going to try and conquer. Does that make sense? Whether it's out of a, like a, a centralizing because of a fear and, and then being able to protect themselves, or is it a single person or a single group of people going, oh, we, we're looking at Charlemagne and go, being, oh, anybody who's coming forward and saying, I want to have that power for myself just up here. I cannot answer that question. I, I don't know. Okay. I think I think certainly later we see we do see Danes who align with like Louis the Pious trying to take over the kingdom of Denmark fighting against their cousins or their nephews or whatever who are trying to reflect who are trying to create like a mini Frankish kingdom up in the north but at this period I think it's more reactionary but we don't have any records internally mm -hmm. all we have are records from the Franks so I I cannot I cannot in yeah. good conscience in conscience as a as a historian archaeologist make that claim people are so used to that answer on here don't worry that's okay. and, and to me that's the correct answer because of the honest one i'd be much more worried if you were like oh yeah absolutely this is what it is i'd yeah. be more, much more concerned and it's probably a mixture of the two it's probably a reactionary one and then people are humans are humans they're always yeah. going to exploit a situation so if the situation arises out of fear and reacting then somebody's there's always somebody's going to go okay now i can use this to to snowball and gain my own kind exactly. of exactly factions uh, yeah and uh, their, their yeah. advantage from it so okay because that's kind of got me confused in a sense of oh maybe you can answer whether it's even true I okay. guess because I have heard some con controversy about it. The this idea that Lindisfarne was a reaction to Charlemagne. Did he decapitate oh. like a shit, shit ton of people? Apparently, or something. Uh, was it like five thousand people? He seven eighty two um, at the um, Treaty of Virgin Battle. Of I'm going to Google that, but it was 782 because yeah. that's, that's the same year that Wittekind crosses the border into Denmark. So I, I guess this is, this is how I've heard it. Okay. This idea that, that Charlemagne, I think beheaded like, a, it was like 5,000 people, something yeah. like that. Yep. And then there was this reaction by Scandinavia to attack Lindisfarne because um, oh, the, the Cuthbert 
because apparently Cuthbert was Cuthbert was in some way involved with Charlemagne, and he left and went to Lindisfarne, which was his monastery, and then this attack from Scandinavia on Lindisfarne was like a a reaction to to that to be like fuck you Charlemagne we're going to attack Lindisfarne take oh that's fascinating who who said that um I feel like it was Stirla Ellingvag I think okay back, back along this was one of the earlier interesting episodes. theory no I think proof. It, I, I don't want to put also I just have to say yeah I'm not putting words in Stella's mouth he may have said it completely different to that um that's just my recall my recapping of that conversation and I'm just kind of seeing it spat around like different areas and me kind of put it putting it together um so I'm not I'm not putting words in his mouth it's his explanation was probably way different because he's a scholar yeah. and I'm not. Yeah, that was that was like a very broad, quick kind of understanding of how I've heard it. And I'm sure yeah. people who listen to this will have heard something similar. I, I've never read that. Like I've never seen that written down. And we talked about like um we've talked about peer review and stuff and why like when like when I have my viva, I do think it's very important to be challenged by experts. So mm-hmm. I've never come across that written peer-reviewed challenge by experts. I think it's a very interesting theory. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think that we have any sort of proof to back that up. Yeah, I think I think I think even even when Stowe said it, it was very um it was like a theory. He didn't put it forward as like fact. It was just okay. an <laughs> idea that it could have been but I guess maybe it would be odd that it was nine years later. Yeah. It would be. But I think also the Saxons, like I said, they're this line between, the Saxons are this line between the Danes and the Franks. You know, they're very much where Northern Germany is today. Mm -hmm. And the archaeological evidence that we have is that the raids that took place on Ireland and likely Lindisfarne and Iona, this kind of these first raids likely took place from the west coast of Norway. So I also feel, I also personally feel that raiding Lindisfarne when you could slip down into like the west coast of France would just i i don't know like logically i don't know why you would cross the sea when it would be easier just to follow Mm -hmm. i feel yeah i feel like it had it's to do with uh oh what i read anyway and this could be that somebody just made the connection after was that it was to do with saint cuthbert maybe being involved or around Charlemagne at the time and then he's then resides in the monastery in lindisfarne Um, but that also could just be people making a link after the fact and going, yeah. oh, well, he was kind of there or thereabouts and now he's here. Maybe. And, you know, it could be very, yeah. it could easily be that it could, because I don't know how how well informed the Norwegians would be of St. Cuthbert's whereabouts. And also, yeah, the, the massacre of Verdun in 782 was done to the Saxons and everything that I've come across is the Danes don't have a super strong the Danes is definitely not the Western Norwegians didn't really have a strong allyship with the Saxons. Oh, maybe. I, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess, again, it could just be a warning of like, don't come up here. We're going to take your gold. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. It's not my idea. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> I don't want to. Ba- I don't want to bash anyone. No, no, don't. Yeah. No, be be honest. You like saying you're no. Not I just. I. I. I don't. I just. Dis- I disagree with this theory. Yeah. Well, that's my honest opinion. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. And I. I probably told it very terribly as well. But it's. I've certainly heard that. I that idea of like, that being like a triggering point for, the start of the Viking Age. But it, like I say, it could be this like romanticizing after the fact because it's easy to make these links when you can 
yeah. sit back and look at like maybe like a map that you've created and you can look at all the different points in the timelines and go, oh, well, clearly it's this when in the time it's not yeah. that obvious. I mean, I just don't even remember what I was doing 11 years ago, so. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. Oh, 11 years, I said nine years earlier, didn't I? 11 years. But yeah, yeah. It's 11. But I, yeah, I guess, because I, I think the other the other part of it was the purposeful I think people made like a point of like the purposeful destroying of like Christian rather than just taking things like the purposeful destroying like maybe uh, sites like Paul, Paul but, Muhammad. But I just I don't I don't think I don't think that they had it out for Christianity. I think that that's such like I think that's such like a oh, yeah. fucking like alt right like kind of uh, runes, you know. Like I just I think that that I think. I think that's such a modern interpretation that the Vikings gave a shit about Christianity. I don't think they did. I think to them, it, they were just an opportunity. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I would agree. I think yeah. that it was, um, yeah, that, because I like say it was, it was this idea that they destroyed, like they would have gone out of the way to destroy crosses or deface yeah. things. Yeah. That, but then again, I just think you're a, in most cases, I can't assume, but in most cases, a bunch of guys who are running around stealing stuff and having a good time, I guess, to them, they're, they're getting wealthy. They're, they're, they would be enjoying it. Somebody, and you're probably just going to destroy some stuff because guys are a bit dumb like that sometimes. And we just break shit when we get excited. I so mean, I don't, you said it, not me. So. But, but it's true. Like I've been around, especially for the drinking as well. I played in rugby teams. Like I've been yeah. around guys when they drink it. Sometimes they just break shit for no apparent reason because it might be funny. Um, so I think that might happen. The, the similar thing could happen. It doesn't mean that they're then aiming to attack this thing because it's some symbolic fuck you to Christianity. And yeah, I think maybe people look into it a little too much, but it, there is this huge hatred for, or certainly now, Again, if you go online and on Facebook, like I do, because I'm an asshole and I can't help it, um, there is just every like anybody who's interested in this stuff. There's kind of like a, I would like to say like a an entry level. Once you, I think once people start to read more into it, um, they kind of become more educated and not as narrow, straight minded with things. One um, helps, yeah, yeah, hopefully, but. Certain like people at the entry, they just have this such detest for Christianity because they're like, truly the Vikings must have hated Christianity or like anybody who was pagan hated Christianity. So fuck you. And it's just like, I don't think it was that simple. I mean, like I'm an atheist today and like, I don't hate Christianity. I, I don't, in the same way that I don't hate Muslims or, or Islam or, or, or Judaism. Like, it's just like, people have their own beliefs and like whatever like I don't, and i you know and it's like we're still like we're humans today we were humans a thousand years ago you know i i don't think it especially in the north where they didn't have a practicing religion that was anything close to christianity no book no you know uh, probably probably personal rituals, probably larger rituals, whatever that was, however they practice their faith. Like, I don't think it was this all consuming hatred that like we like to envision. I think that that's a very easy narrative to write. And I think it was a narrative that was started by the Victorians that it was like, that these were like, Oh, anti-Christian, the noble savage, you know? And it's just like, <laughs> I just, I think that that's simplifying something in a way that has already just been simplified in the sense that they, they were just humans looking, you know, with different, again, the past is a foreign country and we can't look at Christianity and paganism through modern lenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have to remember that they weren't privy to the amount of knowledge that we are. Like no. we, we live in, we live in a time where we know more than we ever have. You know, you can just search Google something, you can pick up a book, there are tons of opportunities where you can learn about things. Whereas, you know, back a thousand years ago, that wasn't the case. You couldn't just research something. It was someone, had, mouth, yeah. Yeah, someone will have had to come and have told you. And then uh, yeah, I just feel like this whole, and people just fall into the trap of encompassing everybody in Scandinavia and the Viking age into one 
Yeah. Box and, let, and let's not forget seen. that like by the 850s, parts of Denmark and southern and southern Sweden were Christian. Let's not forget that by the year 1000, like there were like Denmark and Norway were effectively Christianized. Like it wasn't, it was just, it wasn't Christian. Okay. This is my two cents. This is the hill I'm going to die on. Christianity in Scandinavia in the Viking age, not a big thing. No one cared that much. Probably. Yeah. That's, Probably. that's, that's my hill. And if I get hate mail, so be it. <laughs> no, I don't think, um, no, I don't think you're far off. I think, because in, in some cases there are examples of like a forced conversion. So I think then maybe those people cared because that could probably sucked. But also there are cases where it was very, uh, I guess, profitable to, to convert. It was very, you know, you could gain, there was a lot to be gained from converting, whether it okay. was protection, land, 826, 826. Denmark is ruled by the sons of Godfried. Um, their, their uncle is this guy named Harold Clack. So 826 in the Frankish annals, in the in the royal, the royal Frank. Yeah, the royal Frankish annals. Um, it says, at the same time, Harold came with his wife and a great number of Danes and was baptized with his companions at St. Albans in Mainz. The emperor presented him with many gifts before he returned home through Frisia, the, the route through which he was come. Um, he was given a count, the county of Ruskin um, so that he might find refuge there with, with his possession if he were ever in danger. And then at that, so he is now Christian. His wife is Christian. His court, his court of Danes is Christian. And he's asking Louis the Pious to help set him back up on the throne in Denmark. Mm -hmm. so 826 yeah. already like i i don't buy that like christianity was this big scary hated thing it was it was a tool mm -hmm. i guess that it, it would be a tool to the elite but maybe to the everyday person the, what do they get to gain from it other than maybe being told to convert um the promise of heaven in in the Roman times, we see that women and slaves converted to Christianity before um, free men did. Um, it started as kind of a grassroots thing because they're being told that in heaven, everyone is equal. And okay. while life really sucks as a slave now, one day you'll be up in God's embrace. Mm -hmm. And so like there's this idea of conversion queens that we see in Anglo-Saxon England in the fifth and or in the sixth and seventh centuries where the women are bringing Christianity to their husbands and saying, I'm not going to fuck you until you convert like women and slaves, like don't discount them. They're the ones who bring Christianity into, into Rome, into Europe. So mm -hmm. I think, yeah. So, and again, if you're out, if these Viking men are out taking slaves, they're taking Christians and these Christians are coming into the houses and they're telling their mistresses and saying, Hey, look, like, yeah, your men is, your men are pigs. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, they, they don't treat you equally because again, that's a myth. They did not treat women equally in Scandinavia at the time. Um, and they're saying that, look, like in the, in the hands of God, you are equal. Like that's that's pretty seductive to hear. Oh, of course, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so I think that the average layperson is getting a lot out of Christianity. Okay. Yeah. Just... yeah. No, fair enough. You've you've changed my mind. Okay. There we go. <laughs> or, or I've just hammered you into <laughs> no into agreeing no, no, no. with me. No, never, absolutely not. Okay, so back to the back to the map. Okay. Where back we're to the map. All. Um, is there anything in particular that you you learned or thought that jumped out from from putting this together? Was there anything that like really changed your mind on maybe what was there before? Or yes, the uh, quick answer is yes. Yes. 
I mean, I think I was very seduced by the idea that um, the Viking Age began with a series of raids. Um, but then with the map, when I turn, yeah, so I think when you click into it, different layers are turned off. But if you turn on source references and then you turn off all the archaeological stuff and you, I have this on before me, and you watch the chronology play out, I have a legend for the source material where um, the conflicts are these red diamonds and di acts of diplomacy are these blue squares. And within the continent, within France and Germany, you see a series of blue squares happening, which is why I am very convinced that the Viking Age is political more than it is a series of random acts of violence. And I think right. it has to do with the centralizing of power in France, in Denmark, in Norway. And then you also see that England, Southern England, mostly left to its own devices. And you see a series of raids happening in Ireland specifically, but then it's also likely hap happening along the northern coast of Scotland as well, which don't have, again, which don't have sources for the time. And so I do think that Denmark, the kingdom of Denmark, was in kind of a political crossfires with Frankia, while the western coast of Norway, whatever powers were up there, were trying to set up a trade colonies over in Ireland and Scotland. So I think that's how it went up until the 850s. Okay. So what would be, because you said di diplomacies, uh, what, would, what would they be? Attending meetings at the court of Charlemagne, at the court of his son, Louis the Pious, um, asking for peace, claiming that they want peace despite minor incursions. Mm -hmm. um, King Godfrey in 808, he does have a kerfuffle with Charlemagne where he takes the Baltic uh, Frankish city of Rerich and he, re and he redistributes the merchants there to uh, Hedeby. But even in the records, it's not a random act of violence. The Royal Frankish Annals do say that he relocated the merchants of Rerich and he destroyed the Baltic city of Rerich because he knew it, was, it would be profitable through taxes for the kingdom of Denmark. Like we okay. all just kind of like skip over that, but he did it for tax reasons. Mm -hmm. So um, my, my friend Tom Horn has said that um, Vikings were just nothing but venture capitalists. And while yeah. I... Well, I have to I like add a little hash, like a little caveat that like, no, I don't think that they were actually venture capitalists, but they were very much out for profit in more sophisticated ways than we think. Yeah. I mean, we, I say we, people just have this idea of, you know, of the violent savage. That's kind yeah. of what I would say the lay person has, maybe somebody who's not interested in this stuff on any deep level it would just be a savage that goes raping and pillaging stealing and that's kind of all they were now obviously then on a deep level you'd say or oh, were the farmers but i never yeah i never really looked deep into or heard of or we we've never kind of discussed on this podcast before of like the diplomacy side of actually sending people to different courts of of kings within europe and being like yeah we want peace because that shows like such a clear like organization and understanding of the world around you to be like okay yeah we we want we want to we'll do this if you don't do that and that kind of and also it shows a, a kind of a level of maybe not necessarily a pure equality, but some sort of level standing where someone like Charlemagne is going to go, okay, well, let yeah, let's have peace rather than me just roll on over there and do my thing and just take what's, what's yours. It shows that there has to be some kind of power and 
you again centralized power because if it was just kind of all these different little um separate separate you know chief chieftains then i feel like it just it would just be, i'm just gonna go take it why would i why do i want to listen to somebody asking for peace i'll just come and take yeah. it because it's easy i think um this is my big spiel right this was like my pitch when i pitched this project to my supervisor we scholars are very quick to say right scholars are very quick to say you can't look at the vikings in isolation you can't look at the vikings in england which no offense guys but the english are very want to do vikings in england there's so many books called the vikings in england or the vikings of england so on and so forth vikings in britain the whole the whole like viking age is central around england it's like the attack on Lindisfarne, no. and it ends with 1066. But that's like the the commonly known Viking Age is very England centric, isn't it? It's yes. It's but, the exit. It's but Lindisfarne is it? And, is well, it? No, it's, of course not. Of course not. And so that's the thing. So then, and then you do have like oh, the Vikings in Ireland, and then you have the Vikings in Francia. But so like, and I like I have in my thesis all these quotes. Like I pick out from every single like my. My literature review, which is like in my first chapter, I'm using these people who go on to write books that are called the Vikings in England, the Vikings in, in Ireland, the Vikings in Frankie. I'm using quotes where they're saying, of course, we can't just look at the Vikings here. So like I have a whole I have a whole compilation of quotes of people saying like, no, we can't do this. And then they go on to do it. And so the idea is you can't look at the Vikings in isolation. They were no respecters of borders. And so we cannot use borders to isolate them, to look at what they're doing, to look at what happened during the Great Heathen Army. I think the Great Heathen Army is misnamed. I refer to it in my project as the Channel Army because they are going back and forth between the English Channel so many times it makes your head spin. Okay. I I no, gonna get I, a lot of I've never even heard of them going across the channel. So therefore hearing they do it multiple times is but again that's like that's probably a testament to what the, the point you're trying to make of the i only really hear of it from the english side and this idea of this giant army within england that's yeah yeah and this idea of um ivar the boneless being the same ivar of dublin i'm gonna get a lot of hate for this but i think it's complete bullshit i think it's complete bullshit I think that there is a connection between York and Dublin um, later in the like 950s onward. But I think prior to about 950, there was no connection between York and Dublin. There's just no evidence for it. Okay. And, and, and the death dates of Ivar don't match up between the English and the Irish sources. It's just, it's just bananas to me. And mm-hmm. so... Also, England doesn't have a lot going on until really the, there's a couple, there's a couple, like there's Lindisfarne and then there's like Jarrow in 796. And then there's like silence until the 830s at the Battle of Carhampton. And then they disappear for a while. And then it's not really hit until the 850s and the 860s with, you know, the great heathen army, if, if we must. But like I said, I'd like to call it the channel army because it's not, Center, it's not centered on England at all in any way, shape, or form. And um, I think that's completely separate from from what's going on in Ireland and likely the west coast of Britain as well, what, what's going on in Lancaster and Wales so and, and Scotland. So when you say it's, it's going back and forth across the channel, mm-hmm. what, do you, what do you mean by that? Um, yeah. You can just watch the map for a while. <laughs> um, as in, I mean, is it as in there? Yeah, they're literally just, are they raiding over yeah. in France? And then yeah. they're coming back to, to England and then going back. Yeah, that I mean, it, they say it in the they say it in the uh, the Frankish annals. They'll say that like, oh, they finally drove the Danes from the Seine and they crossed the channel over to to trying to find it 
Because oh. it's... It's this, it's the same. Yeah. Um, Christian Coyman talks about it with his hierarchies, which is hierarchies being this idea that they're, they're flotillas that can be kind of split up or brought together as like kind of a centralized fleet that can then splinter off and do their own thing. Mm -hmm. So like there are some, there's some Danes that, that split splinter off and some stay on the Seine and some, yeah, here, 861. This is in the Annals of St. Breton. The Danes had lately come back from England and burned Terron. So that's just, it's, you You hear, you just, if you read it. On the on my map, there's a little button at the top right that says timeline. And so you can scroll through year by year. And the Frankish Annals, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and the Irish Annals are all lined up together under the same... Um, there are different columns on the same row. Mm -hmm. So you can read back and forth what's happening as well, as well as clicking on, as well as watching the timeline and clicking on things. But yeah, it's, it is fascinating because I guess I, I've always learned of the, the great heathen army as like a, the single giant army that's come to conquer England, I guess. But it's just, it's so much more boring. Or Revenge they... the Death of Ragnar. Oh. No, it's so much more boring when you <laughs> consider it just as that. They were doing so so much more interesting things. Mm -hmm. So I, I assume that it wouldn't be the whole army that's, that's going back and forth. It would be... Hydrarchies. Yeah, parts that are going here, there, everywhere. Yeah. And they're kind of... It, which would make sense because it is a... Wasn't the army like a... 30,000 people or something? We don't know. Okay. Rif we don't know. Roughly? Nor, by the way, I have no idea. I'm not going to make an educated guess. I don't okay. know. But, but what I, I would also say, what I would also say is that they were never out to conquer England as a whole. They were never trying to make an empire. Again, that's anachronistic. 10 to 16, Canute the Great did that, but as a Christian king. Mm -hmm. So at this time, um, so in the 850s, by the way, back to politics... In the 850s, the, the Royal Frankish Annals do tell us the Danes have a civil war. All the royals are killed and the kingdom collapses. What follows? A huge exodus and the quote-unquote Great Heathen Army, but also attacks in Francia. So I think that there's a power vacuum. And... Yeah, okay. There are these leaders who go to seek out and carve out new kingdoms. So you have East Anglia that gets carved out, right? The kingdom of East Anglia. You have Northumbria as well that gets taken. But those aren't the same kings. We don't even really know who, which kings they are except for um, Alfred and Guthrum, the Treaty of Guthrum. Mm -hmm. But... Um, but Guthrum doesn't rule over Northumbria. This is not one united kingdom. These are different Danish leaders who are carving out individual territories. And yeah. at the same time, they were also carving out territories in Brittany, in Normandy. Normandy was taken long before Rollo was ever named. Okay. So, so why, why do you think you, we hear about so much in England? Or is it just because I'm... English, so I hear more books because it was here, and people in France or in Normandy hear about the Viking raids there, or is there just more of a focus on England? I think that the Victorians, the English Victorians, did a really good job of. They did like the Vikings. Prop propagandizing the Vikings. Okay. Um. Yeah. I was saying that's why maybe we hear about them more. Yes. Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah, because I guess uh, other than like hearing of, you know, the, the attack on Paris, I don't think I've ever really thought about Viking raids in France before. Really? Um, Spain, definitely, because we did an episode on the the attacks in Spain. But yeah, France have never really thought, like, 
maybe naively, it was very much I thought, oh, well, you know, there was the the attack on Paris as like a big, a big event. I never was that, really... was that because of a certain TV show. No, well, I think I just heard of it, maybe from <laughs> as well. Um, but I never really thought of there being like small raids continuously in the same way that there was maybe over here. There absolutely was. There absolutely was. We just have more awareness, I think, of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. And they gave it a catchy name. They referred to it as the Great Heathen Army, right? The Great Army. Yeah. The Mikkelhera. Whereas it's the interest, right? Alfred himself used the Great Heathen Army as propaganda to 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 prop up his rule to give himself a reason why he should because he wasn't he wasn't the king of England he was the king of Wessex and he wasn't even the rightful king of Wessex he took the he took the throne from his nephew who was the rightful king of Wessex so i mean that that's pretty much like most kings throughout english he, history though exactly but like he had to ha- but he still had to have some legs to stand on right so he's creating this narrative, contemporary at the time, saying, oh, well, I'm the savior of Wessex, so I'm the savior of Mercia, I'm the savior of, you know, clearly not fucking East Anglia, because that falls to to a group of Danes. But, you know, he's saying, oh, I'm a uniter of kingdoms, I'm the great Alfred. Whereas at the same time in Francia, you don't have a single king coming forward saying, I'm uniting Francia. What you're seeing is... Uh, Viking groups terrorizing already fractured kingdoms because you know um, there is no system of primogeniture uh, in in Francia at the time. The kingdoms were split between the sons, so Charlemagne had this big fucking empire, and then his son Louis the uh, Louis the Pious he ruled the same roughly area, but he did lose some territories. But then that got split between his sons, and then those got split between their sons. So by the time you have this great heathen army, this channel army that's over in France, you're having kings just knocked down one by one, trying okay. to just scrabble to, to keep whatever land they're already holding. Mm-hmm. So in England, you see this kind of unifying force, whereas in Francia, you see a disruptive force. Okay. If that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, okay, before we wrap up, is there anything else that really jumps out from the the map that we that you learned that we that we need to know about? No, I mean, I think I think I've pretty much hammered home that I think we have to look at the politics of the period as well, oh, and we can't think of the Vikings as being some burly, uncultured money grabbing anti christian fiends i mm-hmm. think that i think that they were smart um opportunistic yes but being opportunistic doesn't necessarily mean you're dumb it can also yeah. be strategic in itself mm-hmm. yeah absolutely uh, no it's been fascinating i've learned i've learned a lot there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of things that maybe i knew that that now i'm going to have to rethink uh things that i've completely overlooked like the the raise on france that i probably should have known but i've just never thought about it and it's just sometimes you need these these episodes where it's just little common sense things that that you should know but until somebody literally points it out you go oh yeah that makes absolute sense and there was an earlier one in the episode as well but i've forgotten what it was um that you said that i was like oh yeah obviously but i just never kind of made that connection until yeah somebody literally says it i mean like i said the map that I've created, it's open source. You can click on each individual link. You can you can watch the timeline. You can you can see an area that's close to you if you want to visit it. Um, hopefully, one day I'll get uh, postdoctoral funding to to build it to extend it past nine twenty. That's an arbitrary stopping date. It's just mm-hmm. really all I could do. Yeah. In the time that I had, uh, but um. But I do hope that people use it and they learn and they play with it and they have fun with it because I don't know, like I came up with some theories just by watching it like a movie play out over and over and over and over and over again, driving myself like slightly crazy, slightly developing conspiracy theories. But, (laughs) you know, that 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 meme of Charlie from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia with his red strings everywhere. Um, 
but yeah, I think, I think it's, yeah, I, I've got nothing. <laughs> no, hopefully, hopefully people will. Um, and it becomes an important tool for people to use. Cause then that's the thing. It's you've done your bit now, but then you may have somebody that looks at it that specializes in a different area, but then can use that with their, their knowledge. And then that's how you start to, to come together. Because when I, when I first started this podcast, I naively thought that there was just like some big centralized data for all stuff that scholars do. And they just put, all put it <laughs> all, pi- all pile it into this one middle pot and they all have access to it. And you we all just, should. You always talk should. to each other. That's what I. That's what I thought existed. I was like, of course, that makes pu- perfect sense, and it's all like perfectly organized and categorized, and you all just kind of can pull from it and do what you want to do. And then Mateus was like, no, that's not a fucking thing. <laughs> nobody, nobody helps each other out. Nobody talks to each other. Um, that's. I mean, that's what. That's what I have here. Like, I my contact information is like on the map. There's a big, big blue button that says contact. I'm not going to hand out my databases at the moment just because I haven't defended and I need, I need some leeway to get funding eventually. But like the map is there. The information is there. If you guys want to talk to me about it, I am here. Shoot me an email. I don't, I don't want to gatekeep. I, I want people to follow their interests. I want people to learn. I want people to to be curious and and interact and and not fall down into alt right rabbit holes. So <laughs> wonderful. Okay. Well, let's yeah, let's wrap this up. So if if you enjoy the show, please leave us a five star rating and a positive review wherever you get your podcast. And also, if you want a bonus episode every week, we do a QA with the guests after the main show where you can ask your questions either in real time by watching or submit them before and you get them over on our Patreon. It's Patreon forward slash Nordic Mythology Podcast and that starts from £3 a month. So that's just 10p a day. And you also get a bonus episode with Jonas Lorenzen where we read through the saga literature and Jonas puts on a bunch of different voices. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It's just me and him hanging out and we we have a good laugh doing those. And there's our Discord channel. There's a, there's a ton of stuff on there. Um, tonight, where can people follow you? I don't know if you want them to follow you. I have no social media. So, okay. um, so we're just going to put the... Uh, yeah, the website. I, I do have a personal website. It's uh, where you can find the... Like, there's a link to Mapping the Viking Age World. So it is my first and last name. It's www com. You're never going to be able to spell that. So do check the notes. Yeah, and the episode title. It'll yeah. be on there. People can find okay. it. Um, yeah, this, no, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, it's a, just a very easy conversation as well, which is because sometimes scholars aren't the easiest to have a back and forth with. I've spent so many years bartending to support myself as an academic, so I've been forced to learn how to communicate with people. <laughs> well, there you go. I guess that's a good side to having to have a second job, which you shouldn't have to have. <laughs> And Amen. Rocco's decided to start backing as well. So uh, please follow the podcast on all the channels. It's just at Nordic Mythology Podcast. And yeah, we're going to jump over and do a, a quick Q&A.